This is Coder Radio, episode 272 for August 31st, 2017. everyone, and welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and its related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on. My name is Chris, and join us every single week, you know, actually, sometimes even twice a week. It's, it's rather remarkable. It's our host, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hello, Mike. Good afternoon, Mr. Fisher. Hello, Mr. Dominic. I I rushed us into recording when two words came out of your mouth and into your microphone, and that was Japanese whiskey. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you said, so, I was like, okay, I know we got a whole show to do. We got a big show today, but I got to hear about Japanese whiskey. I didn't even know so, they, I guess, of course, they have, of course, there's Japanese whiskey. I never had There it. is. It's called the Centauri uh, Toki, Japanese whiskey. Toki is T O K I. Um, Long-time listeners will know that I've actually had this as the drink of the week once before. Oh, I am failing. I don't remember this. We're failing. This feels like totally new news to me, man. <laughs> it's new information's come to light. So the material difference between Japanese whiskey and, like, you know, regular whiskey or what I normally drink, scotch, is I'm a little bit of a heathen with my scotch. I like it on the rocks. <laughs> but Japanese whiskey, you're intended to actually put it on the rocks and let the ice melt a little. Get a little water in there. Yeah, that's, that's from the... Uh, from the people who make it that's yeah they they huh that is okay all right and uh, and once that happens is it a delightful experience how would you rate it it is interesting um it tastes very good it has a a strong aroma and a very like for, floral kind of thing going on like a, a heavy body it is less alcohol than let's say your johnny red lightweights <laughs> Well, but no, kidding, that, that actually makes it more dangerous, right? Because you, you sit there and sip it. it. Yeah, yeah. Right, you're gonna sit here and drink it yep. like a drink, and yeah. then an hour later, yeah, you know, you're you're installing Windows 10, and oh, listen, you know, I'm not even gonna go there. Oh yeah, we don't want to do that I, again. I we don't comments on that on Windows, but Yikes. we're not gonna go there. Next oh really? Week. Okay, next week. next week. All right. Uh, this actually isn't really for the show either, but it almost kind of segues perfectly into uh, something we are about to talk about. Um, so we'll start with this because it's breaking news right now as we do the show. And that is that Apple has announced the iPhone September 12th event in the Steve Jobs Theater. I think that's noteworthy just because it is the first big thing now on their new spaceship campus. And uh, I, I got I to gotta come all clean. There was a moment of me that was excited because of ARKit. And I don't, I don't know. I'm not overhyped yet, but I am pretty hyped. I, I have a little more hyping that could happen. I, the, skeptic, the skeptic in me is creeping in on AR, but with AR Core announced now and AR Kit and the possibilities when it comes to gaming and fitness, just those two categories, and then other other things like furniture shopping and whatnot, I think it's going to be a, a pretty big market for developers. And I think the iPhone is going gonna, is gonna to crush it. And this next one I bet is going to have specific cameras and sensors to make AR even better. So I actually am kind of legitimately excited to see what they have to offer. I am too because I'm, I just think AR makes a lot of like very basic practical sense from a business mm, perspective. Mm, mm-hmm. um, I have to say that I recently, it's weird, Chris, I have this problem. At the end of every August, I crack my iPhone. <laughs> I like dropped it. <laughs> no. Damnedest thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the pro move there is to have like the warranty and get it get it fixed and get a refurbished brand new you one right now. Mobile jump? Yes, <laughs> yes, it is good. Uh, so you might have to do that though sooner than later with your laptop. This is actually where I was going with this. Mm. Um, what happened? Uh, so uh, did you try to put Windows 10 on your MacBook and did you brick it? First of all, you're spoiling next week's show, but I'm not putting Windows 10 on a goddamn thing. <laughs> okay, because I'm looking at this tweet, and uh, it looks like a MacBook that won't boot. It looks like it's already... It is a MacBook that won't boot. Now, no I disc. did get it to boot finally. Oh, you did? It is extremely unstable. There is some sort of problem. <sighs> and because I live in Dagobah now, the nearest Apple store is roughly an hour and a half away. Mm-hmm. 
and I did not have time to make that journey. So I know what I'm doing Saturday. <laughs> oh, this is a pretty new unit too, right? It's not even a year old, well, right? So a little bit of a mea culpa. I bought this unit open box refurb. Oh, okay. Okay. Because you know what? I work on my Lemur, 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 whatever. Yeah, I, I say it like Lemur. You got to roll and the I use R. I the MacBook either when I travel or when I need like creepy proprietary VPN. Um, I don't know that I care to fix it. Like, I obviously care because I bought it and I paid for it. And yeah. I like it not to be a doorstop. But, you know, I don't use it. Like, there's no I mean, touch bar. If it's got a warranty. Is- if it's got a warranty, you should definitely. So it doesn't. That's ah. that's the catch with the refurbs on the. Because remember, I bought a refurb open box, not of the newest MacBook Pro, but of the original one. Mm-hmm. So you got a zombie. You bought a zombie. I think I bought a lemon. No too. wonder why you've had like keyboard problems with keys. Right. I, I think what happened is someone returned this MacBook Pro to Best Buy because it didn't work. Best Buy like duct taped it together. And Sends it back, and then Apple sell or Best Buy resells it as a, a refurb. Right. And machine. Apple, like I called Apple. I told I explained the situation. I was very honest about like listen. Bought it from Best Buy. It was a refurb. They said, well, we'll do what we can. The warranty is no good on that one anymore. Um, you know, but we'll do what we can. Except, you know, every anything short of, like, just replacing the hard drive is, like, a whole motherboard replacement. Mm-hmm. Because of the way they solder it all in. Mm-hmm. So, it's not... It, it's, like, 500 bucks or something, but... It, oh, that's... Yeah, that's definitely... It's just that. not worth it, right? Because, like... I can run the VPN on Windows in a VM on, on Pop! OS, which I know you love. And I, I would love to hear more conversation about that, Chris. Oh, you would? What do you, would, oh, what would I you, would. What would you like to hear about that? Our mutual friend Ryan seemed very upset with you. Well, he actually didn't seem too upset. But yeah, he, hmm. he did tweet me back after our show. Uh, and uh, I knew, you know, really, I knew what I was saying was, you know, if you're working on a project and somebody says those things about your project, uh, you're, it's not, you're not going to like it. Uh, and, and, and so it's, you know, I've sort of been holding my tongue for a while. Um, but yeah, he did write, he did ping, he did ping me back and he, he corrected my mistake. I, I said there was only one developer in the, in the group, in the room, but there was actually two developers in the room. Um, and one of them, uh, is, uh, is a Redox, uh, Red, o- Red Ox OS or however you say it, developer, uh, Redox OS, I think is how you say it. And his name's Jeremy, which is a cool project too. Um, so yeah, I, you know. Uh, I really don't have much more to add. It's because really at this point, it's just sort of sit back and wait and see how things go and hope that it works out for the best, I think. Right. Isn't that what's next? So I, think it's- I, I, I feel pretty confident that it's going to work out. I mean, I like Pop! OS. Um, you know, I'm in Pop! OS right now talking to you, right? It's mm-hmm. my full. I mean, I'm definitely not on my freaking Mac. That's for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. You know, it's, it's, Honestly, I live in VS Code and, and like and the fish cell, right? So I I I think you made I mean the only the only point you made that kind of and I even mentioned it to my wife who, you know, former Microsoft employee was like, you know, Surface Pro 4. Actually, she was Chris, she was upselling me. She was pushing the Surface laptop. <laughs> you know, if you were going to get a, like if you were going to go in on a Microsoft Surface system and you wanted it as your primary development machine, I mean you, you I mean, if you're going to go with a Microsoft machine, it seems like that might be the one to go with. Oh, she she is, you know what? One day I expect Satya Nadella to show up at her house and be like, "Laura, please, we need you. <laughs> go conquer the world." She's a selling machine. <laughs> and she believes in it. I mean, we just, We're not going to talk about Windows. Let me just make sure. Just make sure if you get one of these uh, Surface monstrosities, just do me one favor and make sure it's got a USB C. No, style. I can't do that because Paul Thorat told me it will melt my briefcase. Oh like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a yeah. thing. I'm telling and you. And also, I I love Linux now. Okay. Yeah. Well, then you know you're set. You're good. I'm you're set. good. Well, actually, that's really the better way to go. We've talked about it. That's that's just. I was just going to say that I, I recently got my hands on a Thunderbolt three dock. Which is a has a USB C plug. It provides power and PCI. Okay, it does connect- provide power because I bought one of those too. And, yeah. Yeah, you okay. got to get a Thunderbolt three one to get to get okay. power and display. Power. So I can drive two four K monitors. I can hook it up to Thunderbolt storage. I can I can hook it up. It has a USB three one hub in there with standard USB A slots. It's got SD card. It's got a sound card in there. It's got a gigabit Ethernet port, 
and uh, it works across Linux and Mac OS, and I would imagine Windows 10 too. Um, so you know my little Lamar here has a USB-C. Right, USB-C, which is, you can still use a USB-C hub with that, which I've done too, which is nice, because that gives you, the, you know, yeah. then it's, but you're still going to have to, you're still hooking up a power cord, and you're still hooking up USB-C, well, and if you want to use Ethernet, you still have to hook that up, like, but this is one cord for everything, like, it's a true docking station, and I would just say, if you're in the market for a new machine right now, get, a, get one with Thunderbolt 3, because the thing that's fantastic about this is... I can now buy an external GPU and I can hook it up to this dock and every machine I now connect gets that. So I make one investment in one video card, in one dock, and all my machines now get that hardware. It, it's a game changer because you can, it means you can move between MacBooks and, and Dell laptops and, and Surface books that have these, if they have these ports. And you are not, you're not reinvesting in peripherals and hardware and GPU every single time. And when you can start looking at stuff and going, well, I don't care if that only has Intel graphics because when I'm using it on the go, it's going to get great battery life. It's going to stay cool. And then when I get down and I hook up to my dock, I can do the machine learning stuff I want to do. I can do the GPU rendering or the video gaming. Uh, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a brilliant future we're moving into. That and, and Intel has opened up a lot of the specs around Thunderbolt 3 controllers, so we're going to see a lot more manufacturers shipping them. Well, I think people forget Thunderbolt is actually an open standard, right? It's not very Apple's excited. Thing. Very excited. I'm also, very excited. Um, this is a bonus for the chat room. I may be doing one of my crazy Marvel Armin style things right now. <laughs> What's this? What are you doing over here? What is this? What? Take a look at the picture. Are there, you Mr. configuring Fisher? a Galaga right now? <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> Because there's this picture in the Discord chat right now uh, that this user Dominic M in there has posted a shot of a, of a Galico. Let, let's just say, if you're in the live chat, sorry, podcast listeners, and you want to like give me some feedback on my uh, configuration here, you, you wanna, have about 10 minutes to do that. So uh, 3.5 gigahertz i7, nice. It's going to be some battery there, but that's not bad. 16 gigs of RAM out of boy. Jeez, that's nice. 500 gigabyte M.2. I wouldn't really change much. Uh, the only thing you might consider is looking what the market value is for the MacBook Pro or the MacBook that you have, whatever it is, and seeing if it's a, if it's if it's more than five hundred dollars, you get it repaired, you sell that on eBay, and then you put some of that cash towards the purchase of the Galago Pro. So someone told me that I can actually yeah get it repaired for Apple Care, and then I well I don't I don't I don't have Apple but Care, around, yeah, but for a cost, but less then turn around and sell it. That's mm -hmm. what, that's what I'm thinking because I. Do you need a machine that travels a little better than my Lamora, I think? Uh, or I, would, I need to like fly business class. I stuff. bet you I bet you you could ping one of your friends over there. You could or give them a call and uh, I think there's a firmware update. I think they put out a firmware update that fixed some of the fan noises that I had with the Galago review unit that I because I had like an early build of it. Um, Don't tell me things about fan noises. I'm pretty sure that's resolved. I'm pretty sure that's resolved. Perfect. So here's one of the interesting things is uh, one of the so uh, uh, there's a couple of other now system 76 really sort of led the charge on getting this thing shippable this galago pro SKU. um and they did a lot of r and d on this they worked they worked upstream with the odm to try to make modifications and of course uh, now other odms or now other oems are shipping this config so entraware which doesn't ship in the us uh, so they're not a direct competitor to system 76 really is shipping essentially this same config but one of the things that they opted to do was only ship it with a 1080p screen instead of 4K because they found when they were running at 4K, it was causing the GPU to just heat up constantly and use a ton of more power than it reasonably should, even for pushing 4K. Like there was so, like a bug. And so okay, that was so, causing the fans to run a lot. So it seems like yeah. that should be a firmware fixable thing. But I believe one of the things Entraware decided was the really the best option was just not to go 4K in this, in this device. But I'm thinking they might have a fix for that now. So you might just double check with them. Well, he, here, here's what, what I'm thinking, right? And then I have to say, I know this is this is my opinion, not Chris's. So I have been talking to the folks at System76 um, and not just the lovely Ryan who no longer works there. But I configured some machines and like, you know, I was talking to them about like, are there refurbs? The answer's no, stuff like that. It almost doesn't, makes sense and my macbook died this morning so this is all kind of heat of the the moment thing for me to buy like a 500 dollars from this cheaper machine for an employee who i think that may in fact a salesman from uh, 76 was telling me he felt it was a little under spec for dev 
I might be better off just like giving them pay this Lamore, give them this Lamore, and then buy a Galago. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Where, I think. where I'm going with this, right? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Because the budget was already there for a new machine. It was just like it's a little more money, but yeah, you know, well, it's and, replacing my travel rig. Yeah, and if you're if you're finding you're running into limits with the existing one, specifically around traveling, and you are getting more and more comfortable with Linux as your primary uh, desktop OS. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense for you to get the Galago Pro and the, and that's just well, it, obvious. Yeah, I mean, this wasn't the topic for today, but yeah, we were talking about hardware it, again, which is totally funny because we have so much more stuff me. lined up. But, but like, yeah, long time listeners will know it's a big. I'm not even like considering buying a Mac here, right? Like that's not. The, the only possible competitor to this Galago is a uh, XPS. Mm. And the reason I'm probably just going to do the Galago is I, I, you know, I, I like them, right? I like that they're manufacturing in Colorado. I know they're not manufacturing this machine in Colorado or in seller, but they intend to manufacture here yeah, in the but, US. I mean, they're you a business what? in Colorado. They pay business taxes in Colorado. They right. employ you people in Colorado. Yeah. Let's just say before it became a horrible thing to say, I wanted to make America great again. <laughs> you remember some of my ideas kind of mirror some. Well, I mean, Dell's a, Dell's a Texas visit. company, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah. But no, I, you know, also you though, I th- actually think it's. I think there's actually a legit point you're making in here that uh, maybe I'll reframe for you. Uh, you tell me if I'm right. Uh, this is a machine you're going to use to make a living, and there right. is a certain security in having a strong relationship with the maker of that machine, and that's. That's not a secret. That's that's why that's why large companies like Dell and IBM and HP have very very high end salespeople who build long term relationships with really large client uh, IT people. I I've been on the other end of that where you know they they send you to ball games and they bring in food and they get you box seats and tickets and like they really try to be your buddy because they're building a relationship so that way you feel that level of comfort around the machinery you use to make a living. And so um, it's not the same scale, but it's essentially, it is sort of one small business that respects another small business, both sort of with aligned goals. And uh, so it, you know, that makes sense that you connect on that level more so than with a Dell or a, or a, or an HP or a, or a Chromebook or something, you know, you think I'm right? Or is that a mischaracterization? Well, I like that. Like I called them and said, Hey, I need to buy like three machines. And I actually got someone on the phone. Who was actually interested in like making that sale? Mm-hmm. Yeah. When if I called Dell and said that, they said that's nice. We have a website. Go ahead. <laughs> or even like with the MacBook here, it's like you know, you know roughly because Apple's a huge company and they've been around for a while. You know roughly what your options are, but there's not just like somebody that's sitting up in Cupertino that you could just call and be like, you know, uh, hey Emma, I have this question about you know that machine I bought three months ago, and and, and she would actually literally remember that machine and she'd be like, yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I won't boot today. Like that's not an option for you. You don't have that option with Apple or Dell, and it is literally an option you have with System seventy six. And you know, when you're a small business with a small team, that could make that could be that could save you tons of time and 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 stress. So there, there's my Pro System seventy six. So yeah, I still, I still I think they're a great company. I just I think they're totally nuts for doing their own. <laughs> and OS, I think some but... of the concerns you raise are fair. <laughs> but you know, what you could do is you could buy a Galago Pro and you could run any Linux version you want on it. Well, I could also just like if. Like let's let's fast forward six months and like they totally bomb on pop, right? I could install Ubuntu seventeen ten and be perfectly fine. It's not going to work like that. There's not going to be like a line where everybody's just going to agree it was a success or a failure. And it's not like they're going to promote you know uh, the okay. fact that people buy more machines with Ubuntu than Pop OS or like it's you know it's we're never really going to know. It's that's that's one of the things that's a little bit of a downside is there's only really one one group telling that story and they're always going to tell you the version of story they want you to hear. It is what it is, because uh, really, at the end of the day, as long as the machines are mainline enough and they support the kernel, um, you know, you could run Arch on them, which a lot of people do. So, it doesn't at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. The only way it's really going to matter yeah, is for those those are bad people. those I mean. those like those school districts out there, or those Amazons, or those Pixar's out there that either either want to buy a machine because it runs Ubuntu or they want to buy a machine because they can certify it against a version of Linux that they run in-house. And that's where it's going to get a little sticky. But we should probably move on. I think we've... Do you want to... Uh, do you want to 
Do you want to skip the uh, software topic about paying again, or do you want to just spend a moment on it? Because let's skip it. Okay. I mean, let's just skip it. Yeah, we could always we could always bring it up. It's it's a little timeless, so that's okay. Why don't we do this? Let's thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this here's episode of the My Coda Radio Program. Ocean. Digital, the best ocean. DigitalOcean.com. Go over there. You create your account, and then you apply a promo code Coder Digital. It's one word, and you use it after you've made the account, and then you get a ten dollar credit, which unlocks the awesome power of DigitalOcean. You can start in less than fifty five seconds. All of their machines use SSDs from the really low value like totally like unbelievably low priced machines to the monster systems look at this they have these high CPU droplets with the Xeon Platinum 8168 Skylake 2.7 gigahertz CPUs and Xeon E5 2697A version 4 Broadwells with 2.6 gigahertz on the clock and you can throw tons of RAM at these I'm talking like you know 200 gigs of RAM And you can get started in less than 55 seconds. You can run it for minutes. You can run it for days. You can run it for months. You can do batch processing, data analysis, or get started on the other end of the spectrum. $5 a month, or my favorite configuration, three cents an hour. It's a great way to learn, try out an open source project. And then if you decide to put it in production, which is exactly what I did with Nextcloud, it's just not a, like it's it's not like this whole process of well I got to rebuild and set it up now on my production system. DigitalOcean systems are easy to expand. You can attach block storage. It's not a big deal. I just set it up. I added more block storage. I added a little bit more RAM just to give myself plenty of room. I was started at five twelve, and I say I'll just go a little higher. It's wonderful. It's a great system, and then you can combine it with so many other great services like monitoring, network based firewalling, simple API and an amazing dashboard. With data centers all over the world, there's really nothing not to love. DigitalOcean.com. Go see why they've really just become a huge, huge dominant player in the industry, why they support tons of open source projects, tons of Linux distributions, all of it. Just get started at DigitalOcean.com and use our promo code CODERDIGITAL. That's one word, and you apply it to your account. Let's talk quickly then about a little uh, smart assistance here. I've got thoughts these days. I am not a don't have much experience with Cortana, but the Echo line of products, uh, we've actually triggered we've triggered mine here in the studio once accidentally hey, just during the show. Um, yeah. Oh shit! I bought one too. Crap! Uh, it, nah. it is it. I actually I haven't seen anybody like talk about this, but I wonder if they've recently loosened the awake word um, sensitivity yes. because uh, I all of my devices now get triggered constantly, which I, I never muted my echoes before. I've never had to, but now I actually, as a routine, when I'm listening to content or watching TV or even just having a really active conversation, I'm finding I have to mute my echoes, which has never been a problem before. I don't know what's up with that. So, a um, little off topic, but I recently Ooh, us bought today? An Never. <laughs> Never. I bought an Alexa at uh, my wife Laura's urging. You have to say, and... you have to say, if you say the A word, you have to follow it with a with an abrupt cancel. Try saying echo so that way we don't trigger everybody's devices because it gets obnoxious. I'm doing it on purpose because oh, I my... hate it. Yeah, oh, no, they're going to hate us. You got to call it the echo. <laughs> and I actually, so Amazon has become deeply seductive for me. Mm. Um, they sent me, good job buying your echo. See what I did there? Here's a Roomba that can oh, be yeah. directed by the Echo. And here's a discount on it. Would you like to buy it? Yeah. And you know what I said? Order yes. that now, please. Oh, boy. Here it comes, dude. This is it. Ha- having a thing in the kitchen, and we have like a bar in our kitchen because we you know, the new house in Florida. It's like all modern and stuff. It's like a, like a bar in the kitchen. This is a disaster. Like, this is unbelievably yeah. easy for me to just be like yeah sure why not <laughs> and you see as they get into things like groceries like with their purchase yeah. of whole foods and they have the ones now that are magnetic that stick to your fridge with a button on it and you mm-hmm. push it and mm-hmm. you can just tell don't reorder something yeah i mean i it, think they have both the most simple basic least intelligent product of all of them and they also have the one that's most likely to succeed so i disconnected my google home few weeks ago we, i don't think we ever talked about no this. no but i have thoughts and i that. and i bought a sonos uh we have a sonos 5 in the living room and i bought a sonos one the little one holy for shit my, you're my getting home sonuses office. really well the reason was i'm so you know i listen to vinyl records did you, you did you know that amazon rolled out multi-room audio on the echo yesterday yeah i bought the sonuses first okay I just so want like you to know they, they, they literally rolled that yeah, out. I just, know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but the reason I did that was the Google Home. I'm like, one, Google Play Music is not my primary music source. Yeah. 
um, Apple Music is because I carry an iPhone, right? And I drive a lot. So, hey, Siri. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and I felt the sound quality on the Google Home was garbage. Hmm. And I understand that I mostly listen to vinyl records. And I have gotten your emails, people. <laughs> and I don't care. <laughs> I, 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 I can't get into that with you. That we can't go tangent. Let's just on that. not get into that fight today. Um, I will tell you. So, just really quickly, because uh, I know not everybody cares, but I've had an opportunity. I do think there's a real market here, and I, I just I have to speak from the heart on this. And I'm sorry for those of you that don't care about home automation or any of these tubes or the privacy implications. I, I, I respect your opinion on all of that, and well, I, I ask I ask for your forgiveness for a little bit because I do think there is there is a market to be had here, and I think there is a trend that's happening, and it's gonna, something we're going to be inundated with. So with that huge freaking couch, I've tried all of them now, and uh, I've had the primary experience with the assistant – via um, the phone and the NVIDIA Shield TV, which rolled out uh, Google Assistant. And um, I would describe it as the the Echo is the simplest with the least clear path to revenue, um, other than if you get so big with your skill, Amazon will actually just start cutting you a check for some arbitrary amount that they deem you which should probably get. An which, amazing business model. Yeah, it, it is. Um, the The Google Home... The, the idea is great in the sense that it can surface the knowledge cards that Google has about topics, which is something that uh, uh, the Echo sucks at. And Siri usually just punts to Bing. Every now and then it knows something from Wikipedia or Wolfram Alpha, but it's more limited than, than what the Google Home can answer. But what I have discovered about Google Home is it reminds me of these friends that I've had in the past where they've got an answer for everything. They're one of these cocksure, totally 100% confident in their knowledge of all things, and they have an answer for every question, and they have about an 80% success ratio. So you do end up asking them, because most of the time they're right. But every now and then, they say something that is so wrong that you left going, is that, is that, like, you think about this, every now and then if you just Google these, the, some of the things that Google says in these knowledge cards feels like the ramblings of some idiot on some blog somewhere, and somehow Google is deemed that worthy enough to surface at the top of the results, and that's what the home is reading back to you. And the issue is, an 80% success ratio is a, might as well be a 100% fail ratio, because it has to be 99%. And so I, I, that, that supposed big main feature of it, which is the main stay of it, I found to be worthless. It integrates with less things. Uh, it has less privacy features than HomeKit and Siri. So in the end, I just, I've just i settled on the Echo for now, um, and I'm using Siri for HomeKit automation. So I don't, I'm no longer using the Echo for smart device automation because it's too dependent on internet connectivity, which I have. I lack at home sometimes, where HomeKit can work completely offline and doesn't do any reporting to anybody. So I've, I've, I've moved around a bit. So I have like this hodgepodge now of uh, Google on my TV... Echo in my in my living room, and HomeKit uh, on my phone and watched for controlling all the automated stuff that I have now. It's a real mess. Somebody's got to come together and, and make a. I don't know. I like I I'm looking at actual so, different open source projects to bring it all together, like Home Assistant and uh, and uh, things like that, to kind of just bring it all under a single umbrella. So I I realize how this is going to sound to some of our more progressive listeners, but. My wife loves the Echo. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, the spousal approval seems okay. pretty high. Yeah, and the kids love it, too. Like She's like, why don't you just replace everything with Echo? Mm -hmm. like, you, like, get the dot, get the whole mm -hmm. just the whole kit from Amazon. It's, and like, Yeah, it's part of Hadia's routine. When she wakes up in the morning and she's getting ready yeah. for work, she asks the tube, uh, what's the weather going to be like? She gets the news update. She does that well, stuff. We both and listen. And my point, she hated the Google Home. Like, she, she, she had, like, all kinds of concerns about, like, could private moments, could it be listening? Mm -hmm. could, like, really, re, this is anecdotal and this is basically meaningless, but it, it's interesting that, you know, she is a, I mean, she's working in the tech industry in a sales and business development capacity, but then she worked in the makeup industry, right? She's not like a, a developer or sysadmin or anything like that. And she, right, you know, she's a stay at home mom. She's a normal person, I would say. When she thinks Google, she does have concerns. Yeah, like, she yep. has real. Like, is this thing listening in? Is it going to, you know... I also think that's permeated into people that are maybe a little savvier than average, but, you know, they're, so they're in the savvy range, but they're not, like, experts. I think it has. Hadia felt the same way. Exactly the same way. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I went 
I said the main reason I went with HomeKit because it was offline support, but the other main factor for me going with HomeKit for automation was um, uh, just way more buy-in for Hadia. She, she, so with the Echo, she thought it was novel that we could we could bark at it and have it do stuff. But with HomeKit, she feels like we've legitimately made, legitimately made our home more valuable, our home being our RV, because um, in the mornings and at night, she doesn't want to talk to any cylinders because the kids could be asleep or whatever. Like she doesn't want to make a noise. And so she, she likes the flexibility of being able to control all of those things on a screen, like getting information on a screen, asking questions on a screen, turning devices on and off, getting status and temperatures on a screen. So if you guys are really liking the Echo, you might consider for your future purchase the Echo Show because she's finding that the addition of having a screen makes a huge difference for her, like at nighttime or in the morning. And so that's one of the reasons why Siri and HomeKit has pulled way ahead in the home just because the spousal approval is like, it's not just like she thinks it's okay. She like, she actively likes it. Also, Chris, I'd encourage you to look at the chat. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Is there been continued... continued? Uh, what do we have here? Oh, boy. Is this an updated Galago Pro? Look at that thing. Look at that thing. With the i7-7500. That is a completed order. Yeah. Oh, it is, isn't it? Oh, yeah, you did is. it right on the show. You, <laughs> you got me talking about uh, uh, the uh, smart devices again. And they're... You gave me enough time to... T- Although, creepily enough, Firefox now knows my credit card number. I don't know... Yeah, that's oh, good. That's good. Just I'm back on Firefox. S- and send that back in there. Another creepy Google thing. Do you know why I'm back on Firefox? Huh. I was shopping for a gift for my wife, who who who. This is a test if she's listening to the show right now. And guess what? Ads started coming up. What? Ashley Madison. The search was gifts for my wife, and she's a Harry Potter fan, so I typed in Harry Potter. Right, like so, Harry Potter gifts for her wife. Right on the sidebar there, AshleyMadison.com. Amazing. I can't believe that company is even around like, anymore. Shouldn't they be out of business after that? I thought they were bankrupt. I thought like the government put them out yeah. of business because they were like like yeah. taking advantage of sad, lonely old men. Like, yeah. Hey, we should cap off the uh, the Lady in the yeah, Tube do. stuff with uh, um, the the story that you the reason you put it in there is because um, by the end of the year you're going to be able to invoke. Uh, I shouldn't say it, but the, the echo service via Cortana, and you'll be able to invoke Cortana via the echo service. Echo service being the, you know. Anyway, so that's it's interesting. They're sort of partnering up, isn't it? Uh, Cortana and... Uh, and it makes sense, right? Because they don't want Apple, they don't want Siri to take over, and more importantly, Google, right? They need to have a beachhead against Google. So we talked a bit last week about serverless architecture and got some feedback, got some some questions. Um, in fact, it wasn't even, it's only just been a few days, but uh, do you want to do a little bit, a little kind of follow-up on some of that since that does, did seem to pique some interest? A little, a little thing. Yeah, so, so a few people emailed in um, basically confused as to what serverless architecture is. Uh, so I just want to do a quick rundown, right? So I talk a lot about Azure Functions which is the Microsoft solution. Um, but, you know, you can write in JavaScript or whatever. I mean, I'm writing in F-sharp. Uh, AWS Lambda is the Amazon solution, and Cloud Functions is the Google one. So basically, all the big cloud vendors have a, a solution for this. Now, the key here is that these are uh, state. It's like stateless code that can be run at need. Right, you so are only charged. This is the key, right? You are only charged for the for the compute power, mm-hmm. um, and it's when not you even are like, actively processing data. And and, and 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 it's not the resources are divided up in terms of like executing code on a system, not like you will get ten gigs of uh, space, two gigs of RAM, six processors. Like it's not like a hardware price you pay. It's like just a the length of time it computes. Correct. Is that... Yeah, it's 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 length of time over bandwidth. Okay, okay, yeah, ban- yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. makes sense. So this is just straight up length of time over bandwidth, but it turns itself into like a hibernate state that you are not charged for when it is not actively processing, and it comes up in less than like ten milliseconds, depending on the vendor. Some vendors offer more, some offer less. I don't have a lot of experience with AWS Lambda. And I have no experience with the Google Cloud. I this is a big hole for me, Chris. I, I don't use the Google Cloud for reasons. Basically, 
the type of enterprise customers I work with are either on site, which is amazing these days, or they're looking at AWS, right? Or Azure. Um, obviously for Alice, we have the Bispark deal with Azure. So we're, we're doing Azure. But it's all the same. Uh, the primary difference I found is that the F-sharp support tends to be better on Azure, but AWS has it just as good. And, and Google well, Cloud is more of a... There's, uh, there's Azure yeah. functions like built right into the Microsoft Bot framework, right? So it's sort of like a... Re- it's super... When you combine that so, with the BizBot yes, credits... but I want to say yes, but a big asterisk. So remember, the Microsoft Bot framework has two versions. There's the .NET version in C-sharp, uh-huh. and there is the uh, JavaScript version in Node which runs on Linux. I am actually using the uh, Linux version, the JavaScript version. You animal. No. You know what? Get ready. ready. Send your hate mail to michael at buccaneertech.com. <laughs> I, I am ready to have this fight. Oh, wow. JavaScript is the best functional programming language next to F Sharp. Hmm. If you do JavaScript the right way, it can actually be an extremely powerful functional programming language. Sure. I like the sure. <laughs> well, I, I feel like because I don't see sometimes when we get into these conversations, I don't recently I've been getting flamed and I, I try to stay neutral and then I get flamed for it. I just don't feel like I feel like people should send their hate to Alan at jupiterbroadcasting.com. <laughs> and then I'm just going to I'm just going to like gonna, deal with it a lot better. I'm just going to say this. I think what you're up against right here is a bias of people's people that are, are real angry right now. And, and so the reason why I say why sure angry? is angry. Probably because people get forced to work with JavaScript when they're not, when they, you know, when it's not like they're... Okay. So in the pre-show, in this new fancy Discord web app we're using... Yeah, this, you mean this JavaScript app? Yes. Someone asked me about my PHP hate, and I had to confess that it's actually not the language. It's the people who, like, copy shit yeah, off. That's where I'm going. So you see where I'm going. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. That's where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah, it is, it is sort of like that again. Uh, only just it's the, the names are different and the perspectives are a little different. I, I don't, I, it tires me out a little bit. Because I think no, you're, I think you're, what? I, they're right. We should all be writing in a powerful language that is flexible yet static enough to compile to low level hardware. Do you know where I'm going? Well, Do you know where I'm going? The only yes. language, the only language, the, I'm only thing I'm willing, the only thing I'm willing to hear at this point is Rust. And if it's not Rust, I won't take it. So I'm sorry. Incorrect. I'm sorry, Mr. Incorrect. Dominic. I'm sorry. But I, when we all die. No. It is, not, it is not. A, it is not going to. No. It is. Yes. No. No. It's Rust. It's objective C. No, it is not. No. It is not Rust. No. <laughs> objective C is the one true language. Damn. Like it. small talk is okay. It's like the Abraham to Jesus kind of situation. <laughs> but objective C is the is the way and the light. I suppose. I suppose. I have. Yeah, to, I, I emailed Tim Cook that he said it's time to move on, son. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say Rust. I have to. I'm. Ob- it's in my contract. <laughs> Only because if you don't, Reddit will be ripping you to pieces yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Plus, I'm hoping that somebody will write us a a damn bot for a Discord in Rust. That's what I keep hoping. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you know what I got to inside Rust. You'll you'll be able to run that on like a five dollar Dio droplet forever. So that's <laughs> that's nice. I mean, performance is a thing, right? I gotta I gotta I gotta talk Mr. Dominic there into writing uh, Alice for Discord. Getting now, you know, what would that take? I mean, you, you know s- what? I tell you what, I will do some contributions to the JB bot. However. There's a catch. Uh oh. No one can review my code if it's in a module named j.j misa great dot awesome. <laughs> that just goes right in, right okay. to production. That has to. That has to ship. Okay, I see. I wonder, is that like, hey, <laughs> wouldn't that be the like ultimate Jar Jar backdoor right there? <laughs> uh, Jar Jar rootkit. Well, so uh, we have links to uh, also uh, Amazon's uh, serverless architecture stuff and, of course, the Google stuff. There's so much cool things happening in that space, and I, I, I wonder if it's going to be like another, another. Uh, it is, it is another wave of sort of, um, what's the way to put this? Layering out the compute in a way that yeah. you can sort of slice off a layer of compute and sell it, and because of what it is that you're selling, you can sell it at really low prices. Like so, now we've gotten lower than the VPS. Even we've gotten lower than like. We, you know, this so, is like a whole other level of like. Yeah, yes, but I want to counter the hype a little okay, bit. Yeah, okay, lay it on. So, like, Azure, I love you. Please don't turn off my free credits. You're a moron if you use your entire backend for your mobile app in Azure Functions. 
You get eaten alive, you think? We just shouldn't do it, right? You you actually do need a server. Now, whether that server is like a Hiro- remember Heroku? We don't talk about that anymore because they're old now. But mm, don't you no no don't you know what we're supposed to do now is just all put it on a blockchain. So you see, every client what? will have the database. <laughs> you own, see what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Let's do a blockchain on every iPhone. No. <laughs> I use Doku instead of Heroku now because it's the Docker mm. open source version of Heroku. Um, because I love Docker, but you don't need. Okay. Think about serverless architecture as you have this heavy stateless data processing function. Um, let and, and this is one of my favorite use cases here. You are importing contacts from Salesforce. Chris, I cannot tell you how much enterprises pay for Salesforce oh. and how married they are to it. Oh, yeah. This is just an example. I don't mean to beat up on Salesforce. Well, but I think those Salesforce guys really got themselves a good gig, don't they? I mean, that is, are, that's a money maker for ages, yeah. dude, for ages. And there's a lot of data. Like, if, if, if you are working, and I have, with an enterprise who is a Salesforce shop, meaning that they're salesmen and they need some sort of custom development on Salesforce, spinning up an entire server to do some sort of like data massaging or data processing on their Salesforce uh, CRM database doesn't make a ton of sense especially if you can abstract away the functions you need into like five or six you know f sharp or node.js or just javascript or whatever i mean i prefer f sharp for reasons that i won't go into this week but it's fine javascript is fine too you can just throw them on something like azure functions and get back a json response that is very usable and very you know very cost efficient rather than having to worry about the architecture and the uh, overhead of an entire server. Having said that, if you're just doing like a mobile app, well, you actually do need a server, right? You, you, you want like a database that's always up and you want like an API. The part you want to move to serverless is the part that's either integrating with a third-party SaaS or doing the large processor intensive. right. right but not database-intensive processing. So think about this. If you're processing data in memory, that is great for for these kind of like uh, Lambda or Azure functions type yeah. of things. Yeah, that makes sense. It is less great to do your entire application in that. In fact, I would argue, and I've never done this myself, but I, I did some cost calculations. For your basic like consumer-facing iOS app that's like, you know, got pictures and profiles and users and all that kind of crap, it's probably cheaper just to spend. In fact, it's certainly cheaper to put Docker and Doku on a DO droplet and run it that way. And then if you need like an S3 clone, use Minio, which is something I recommend strongly. Um, and all of the tools I just mentioned are totally open source and don't cost you a damn thing other than the five to $10 a month DO droplet, right? I feel like I just yelled at lots of kids. No, oh no! I think uh, you just laid down some. I think that is some. I think we could clip that out and publish that as its own separate uh, clip on YouTube because that is very true. You, <clears throat> it's a very good outline and just from a broad sense of when you would want to go serverless versus when you need something running on the back end that can answer API calls that can provide state. It makes a actually, lot of sense. Here's a, here, here's a really great rule of thumb: if you could put it in a container, it ought to be on a server. If it's just a function that you could like, th- let's talk pseudocode here, right? You could write like function whatever. <laughs> yeah, I actually typed it out for you. <laughs> it's cool. And it should be in Azure Functions or Lambda or Google Functions. That that's like the rule of thumb. And again, uh, Chris just put Minio in the chat. I sw- if you are running out of money, and you are a startup, for the love of God, do a deal volume with Minio. I have a blog post on Buccaneer on IO that gives you line by line command line instructions on setting this up. It doesn't cost you anything. So please, there's no need to pay for S3. Just use Minio. That's awesome. It's awesome. That's a yeah. good tip right there. I'm putting a link in the show. And, oh, and it's API compatible. So if you're using Ruby or Python, let's just take Ruby for example, and let's say you're using Rails, you can just import the S3 gem, the oh. AWS gem. And it's 100% command, 100% that API. That is so handy. <clears throat> nice and quick. So link in the show notes for that. And you can go to M-I-N-I-O dot I-O. And check out Buccaneer I-O. There's a search function. Um, you can type the article's name is S3 clone using Minio. 
There you go. So, so get Mike's yeah. guide on that. And I'll link that in the show notes. There after. you go. There you go. Well, that uh, that was that was some interesting follow up on that topic, and I I I wonder how I can't help. I know this is this is probably selfish of me, but I can't help wonder how this would impact me if I was still sort of in the business these days. What I, I I feel like some of these some of these things you outline, I would almost set up as services to offer to businesses, like like Minyo, put it up on a DigitalOcean droplet myself, and then resell it to them. Like I could see that might be the direction I would have gone with some of this stuff, because oh, otherwise it would have yeah. put me out of a job. I really feel like it would have put me out of a job. Well, so it's interesting, right? Because like DigitalOcean, if you know what you're doing, I found, and this is not because they advertise on the show. This is like, honestly, for, for my businesses, DO is our primary vendor. They were before is, they were a sponsor. They were before they were a sponsor, right? This, I think that's how we found out about them. They are the most cost-efficient vendor possible. Because at the end of the day, I mean, they haven't. Now they've added a lot of stuff, like they've added object storage, they've added all this other stuff. I have yet to try the object storage, so I'm not super familiar with that. But five bucks for a Linux VPN or a BSD VPN, VPS. and I can do whatever the hell I want with that. Yeah, yeah. it's just like, yep. I know yeah. it's so awesome, and, and and it changes the game a lot. And then when you can start abstracting out things even more, like the like storage or like just compute on something that just needs a good you know quick computational render i could even see that at jb like rendering out video and then setting it back to a persistent plate i fascinating trend and uh, well i have actually spun up i mean this is again this is not a commercial this is something i really did i have spun up droplets to do data processing because it was just easier to throw up a docker container on an ubuntu droplet than to like do anything fancy, right? <laughs> yeah, and then just just rip them down, right? Delete them. Do has that nice API? You can do it from the terminal. Or, mm-hmm. I mean, I just logged into the back end, did it, but yeah, we uh, or tie it into your bot like we do, or do it from your phone. Uh, yeah, it's super- send Chris thirty text messages. Yeah, it really changes everything. I know we talked about it too much. Let's you know if you so if some of these things like serverless computing or Azure and AWS. Uh, if they if they're going over your head or you want to know more about them, that is where our next sponsor comes in. Linuxacademy.com slash coders. Go there to support this show and sign up for a free seven day trial to Linux Academy. Linuxacademy.com slash coders. It's a platform to learn more about Linux with self paced in depth video courses on every Linux, cloud, and DevOps topic. So that checks a lot of boxes. Hands on labs. Real scenario-based stuff that gives you real-world experience. You pick your distribution, the courseware, and the live servers match that automatically. And if you ever get stuck or need help, they have real, full-time human beings that can help you out. I, I've been impressed. To be honest, Like there is <clears throat> not, not a lot of companies that can match them in this space. I've been really impressed with the growth here because you would think you would think these other guys would have figured it out by now. These other online schools would have figured it out by now. But Linux Academy continues to crush it. They, they reinvest back into the instructors, into the courseware, into keeping content current, into working with the community, going to events and being out there where the community is at. It's really been impressive to see it. And they're getting more and more credibility. It's, it's been amazing to see some of the awards they've been winning. You can get a sense of it when you look at their Twitter feed. They're humble about it. I think, like, I think they could brag even more. I feel like they could brag even more because watching them since they've even just been a sponsor, I mean, it must all be because of Jupiter Broadcasting. We can only take the credit. I assume it's all because of us. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little BS stuck in my throat there. <clears> throat> uh, I, it's been really something to watch. And they every now and then they'll say, hey, yeah, we got this other award, or hey, we have this new partnership with the Linux Foundation, or hey, we've, we're working with Microsoft on these new AWS courses, or hey, we've created this entire new introduction to AWS that's it's really unique and story-driven. Like it's It's stuff that... It's stuff that nobody else is doing, and it's just constant value that gets added to your subscription. And you can start seven days for free at linuxacademy.com slash coders. Go to linuxacademy.com slash coders, support the show, and sign up for that free seven-day trial. linuxacademy.com slash coders. And thanks to Linux Academy for sponsoring the show. That way I had an excuse to sing that there at the the very end there. Mr. Dominic, uh, you had tweeted something that sort of fit perfect with something that I was going to stick in the hoopla anyway, so I'm going to set it up for us. Before we get to what you, which you, uh, which you kind of teased in a recent episode, actually, so it wasn't just a, it wasn't just a tweet. It's like you're Donald Trump now. We're just going off your Twitter feed. Um, what six months <clears throat> of working remotely taught me a thing or ten, and I won't go through all ten, but uh, be as available as possible when working remotely really struck a note with me because 
it's the best way of really showing you're there. But also there was there was things that communicate clearly. But this one, this one I have to say, it sounds a little rough on the surface, but I, I really agree with it. And it's it's just the game you gotta play if you really wanna have a successful remote work environment. <clears throat> Offer praise and positive sentiments early and often. Praise and positive sentiments. You'll need to go out of your way to foster a sense of teamwork. You won't be around to share the little daily wins with the rest of the team. But having a positive relationship with your coworkers is essential to being able to do your job well. This this reminds me of a little bit of an anecdotal story. Um, Years ago, I hired my first hire, uh, actually a, a former Linux user who father i have sent i converted him to os 10 Did you, was, was it the touch bar must have been the time no, that's what brings everybody no, this over way before the touch bar it was actually time machine i think he was really interested. people used max before a touch bar how is that possible you know i think people are using max less now because of the touch bar what do they just have, the what do they just have those gaudy f keys up there just sitting there with their functionality you mean and the buttons keys that actually like do stuff yeah we seem to have gotten lost here. <laughs> okay, go on. But my, my point was, um, not so long ago, and he's moved on to bigger and better things out in Kansas. Um, and I, I'm not going to name names because telling stories at a school. But because I tend to be busy, as you might imagine, right? I do like four jobs. He thought I was angry about something that I wasn't angry about. And he's like, he sent me like a Slack message. It was like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't get this on time. I know you want ex- results, not excuses. And it's so easy to just like seem like an asshole when you're managing a remote team, right? Like a total jerk, like a total like, yeah, because you know what? You're it's easy, right? Unless something's on fire. Yeah. You're not going to send that Slack message. You're not going to send that email. You're going to, you know, do what you need to do. Yeah. Plus, I think humans can't help but <clears throat> project a story on the other end of the screen so that way they, they know what to interact with and they just fill in right. blanks and they, they interpret things one way or the other. Right. That's one, not to not to really be super, make this a plug, but when, when you talked about Alice initially to me, that was one of the things I was like, that's one of the things I like is have the bot be the bad guy. So that way I don't, you know, with remote teams, that's a, that, that can be a sensitive thing sometimes. And, you are a legendary coward. I mean, how many times have I showed up late to the show? Legendary. Legendary. I uh, I don't know what to say. <clears throat> I just, I hate confrontation. But thankfully, I've never been caught online having a confrontation in my life to prove otherwise. Uh, moving on. So that's why I wanted to read this next. This next uh, breaking news from Michael Dominic's Twitter feed. Uh, I went to leave some space today. But at the end of it, I couldn't bring myself to do it. A total 180 going back to remote work. Hashtag Coda Radio. Uh, you uh, you got as far as getting a tour of a spot, huh? Several. And um, did at any point, were you excited about the space? Were you like, oh, I'm looking forward to this? Like, how far did you go down this hole? All right, so here's what happened. I saw three spaces from the same real estate person. I liked one of them. Uh, the woman showing me the space quoted me at a price there. It was a little high, but I was like, mm, well, we could talk about it, but, you know, theoretically, okay. We'd have to, like, you know, work on those uh, maintenance fees a little bit. I came home. The next day, I get an email. We went up from X to X plus 500 or X mm. plus 4 or 15 or And this something. is just based, like, before you've got internet in there and stuff like that, right? This, this is, is before the cost of, like, yeah, the yeah. business's cost. Yeah. It's just, like... You cost. don't have water service at this point. You know, you don't have, you know, so, all those things. So then I got into a conversation about... I- internal conversation about, like, what could I do with this money? And what is the real problem that I'm trying to solve? Well, the real problem I'm trying to solve is I have customers who need work done, and we are above capacity why not given up now i did get burned by a few remote people um i got some invoices that i felt were aggressive shall we say and some timesheets uh, on employees that didn't seem exactly kosher but having said all of that I literally own Alice. I own the tool that can solve this problem. It's true. And I'm not spending $1,500 a month on a freaking space. Like, I'm sorry, but it's not worth it. 
right? Not to name numbers here, but, you know, I would rather buy a Galago every month. Than that <laughs> and yeah. it's not even like I don't have the money. It's just I don't want to do it because, mm-hmm. one, I've been trying to hire developers. And, I, and this is actually a good call out. If you had applied for a job before with Buccaneer, apply again. Because previously I was looking for only on site, and now I'm willing to do remote. So Ooh. I may actually be willing to talk to you. Now. Job sees is there a is there a Buccaneer IO page they go to? Uh, there's actually go to Indeed. It's under the Mad Botter, but okay. There you go. Go to the Mad Botter page. Okay, yeah, so 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 here's what happened. I did the cost analysis. Yeah. And then I was interviewing candidates for on site developer jobs in Florida. And I'm like, gee, I've interviewed some Coda Radio listeners who are like in you know weird places like you know whatever they're in like Kansas or whatever like weird Midwest. places. Like, I, thought, I thought you were gonna say something like there was Middle East, and you came out with Kansas. Have well, you ever been to Kansas? We legitimately have people listening all over the world in countries that do not speak English, and we still have people listening there. And you pick Kansas. Okay. First of all, have you ever been to Kansas? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I haven't. Okay. Kansas is like Narnia, as far as I'm concerned. Really? It is another world. I should go. You won't like it. The Cokes own everything. Um, And I was like, these are qualified developers who kind of know what I'm like and know what I'm about. And I just said no, because I want someone, I want to butt some seats, right? And then the people I'm getting here, nothing against them personally, but it's like, you know, Plant City, Florida is the damn jungle. It's, I had two kids out of college and a Jaguar apply. Like, (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah. Why not give him a shot? And, and, you know, maybe I could do things like mandate, you know, calls and mandate status meetings. So then I started working out the cost of the office over a three year term versus what I could do with that money. And I sent the uh, young lady who showed me the office a nice email back saying, thank you, but no, thank you. I'm I'm really I think this is a really good move. I I could only imagine the temptation. So I totally understand it as somebody who has a physical space and pays for it every single month. Uh I so I totally understand where you're coming from. Um but I also I have also several times very very seriously considered this year if I maybe in in you know 6 months or something wanted to put this place up for sale and really consolidate down to something small and mobile. It just when you're making a product that you sell on the internet and your your presence is via your website on your internet and all the other places we publish, the physical building is really insignificant except for with a studio, obviously, and production equipment and trying to get good sound and having everything reliable. It really is beneficial to have a physical space. So I did give it serious consideration about twice this year so far to see if maybe Jupiter Broadcasting could save a little bit of money because that money that we pay for uh, this space could be put back into maybe hiring, you know, additional editors or another part-time host. You know, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways I could use that money that would be extremely beneficial to the company. So it's a really hard line to walk. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you didn't pin yourself down because once you make that commitment, it, it, the business begins to form itself around the space. And, you know, on-site becomes more of a thing. Having meetings there is more of a thing. Infrastructure costs is more of a thing there. Then you start considering as it goes on if clients are going to meet you there. And it starts becoming more yes. and more of an investment in a space. Right. The business starts to form around the space instead of something. You have the flexibility of being this dynamic remote thing that, yeah, I think it's a really good move for the business because you're you're yeah. not going to be pinned it, down. And then later on, you know if things change, you know, you, that's totally different. That's fine. That's good. Well, the reality of the situation, too, is like most of my clients are not in Florida, nor are they in New Jersey, um, where we nominally actually do still have an office. Um, But it's like a one-room little space with a bunch of servers. There is no legitimate, like, let me me say this differently. If this was salesman radio instead of coder radio, right? I have I never have closed a sale in my office, maybe once or twice in ten years. Because you know what, if the customer is big enough, I hop a plane ticket and I go fly to them, right? Mm-hmm. So what is the point in spending all this money on 
a fancy office. And uh, you'd have to be somewhere works. downtown in the in the heart of a market where people would Which be. This is space I was looking at. No, this was. I mean, let me tell you, fifteen hundred bucks a month, or it was fourteen, whatever. In Plant City, Florida, is a lot of money. That's prime real estate. Mm. So it was fancy, but it, it was basically useless. Yeah. In terms of yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that seems like you might have dodged a bullet because it's one of those things that uh, you and really you know got to make sure you're if it's if it's right, you really got to make sure it's right because you're set. Then because you'd be in for what a year. You'd be in for actually least, two years. Two yeah, years, yeah. Two years, yeah. Two years, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah. Which is obviously, you know, six months down the road, things are going great. You're like, ah, you know, this remote thing was a good shot. It was worth trying. But now I've definitely decided we do need butts and seats. It's not like you can't change it, which is, that's why it's, but you couldn't have changed it if you had made this decision. Well, and the hiring pool is the, the real issue that pushed me over the edge. That there's tons of qualified candidates in other regions, even if I restrict myself to the U.S. Yeah. Hey, what, do you think about these, what do you think about these folks that are doing more and more just, all day workday video stream. Even like when they get up to go to the bathroom, like they'll just leave the camera. I don't on. like that. I think at that point, if you don't trust the person, you you, you should just let. Them oh, I no no no. Oh yeah no no no. So I got I got a I got a couple of different people in mind, and they uh, it's, it's they're they're coworkers. They're not bosses. So it's not like boss to boss. It's like the coworkers video each other. So it's they're like they have a they have a second screen with the webcam on it, and they put the video chat on that, and everybody that's working in the group does that. And they work like that all day long. I guess the boss could join. I think the boss can join, but generally it's just the coworkers. I don't think that's particularly productive. You know, I think it's getting really common. Why? Well, it's like somebody sitting in the cubicle next to you. It's just like that. And you do have the option for privacy from time to time. I know some I mean, of them do that. but you don't trust the person, you ought to just to fire them, right? I don't think it's for trust because it's coworkers. I think it's like camaraderie. Like they have moments, they make jokes back and forth. Like I've heard a few well, stories. We have like... Like we have a running joke about a dragon making love to a sedan in my, in our Slack for <laughs> several years now. <laughs> I mean, there are jokes. There, I mean, let me put it this way: if I ever faced a shareholder lawsuit, thank God I'm the only shareholder. Um, I'd be in the same boat as poor Travis Kalanick. I'd be out, and that's it. But it's so not, not for you. Then I take it. I don't think I'd want to do it either. When no, they told me about it, I was like, for me. part of my process like, is the fact I, that I have to be alone and and have solitude. That's part of my process. But you for know them, what they're all about it. And these are developers. These guys are developers. And they like I, it. They I like would it. never. They share music and links because it has a chat too. And yeah, it's like, it's like. Well, we do that in Slack. Like that's what Slack is for us. We share music. We share YouTube. They have, a lot they of have YouTube persistent videos. video going. They have persistent video going yeah. all day. They all, they, yeah. yeah. And, and I can think of, I know of two companies where I've heard that they do this at. I don't think that's for me. Like, like. I have my Lowell's bot printer here and I just printed out a train for my son, you know, a locomotive I'm printing it out in parks. Cause I have the mini. I don't think I would want a, a running video when my, my 16 month old walks in no. and like sees that I printed him a train and starts playing with it. Like a, that's a moment I think ought not to be broadcast. I agree. I just think it's an interesting thing that people are doing to make remote work more like being <sighs> in the same space. It sounds like a trust problem to me. It sounds like a lot of bandwidth to me. Is what I thought. I was like, damn, all day long you're streaming that, huh? I do have <laughs> ISP from a very local ISP down here. That does sound like a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. Probably to them too. Yeah, that's the other thing. But you know, uh, I I would imagine I didn't I, I didn't really like probe a lot. Um, but I would imagine they must have quiet times too, right? You'd have to. You'd have to, because otherwise you'd go well, mad. Yeah, I like to have like every like one day a week, like every Wednesday, is just heads down coding time for developers. We we're not going to bother you. Just do what you need to do, yeah. and then we'll sync up on Thursday. Yeah. But, well, Mr. Dominic, uh, I enjoyed chatting with you. I'm glad to hear that things have gone in this direction. I think it was a good move for you. Anywhere you want to send folks before we get out of here. Got the yeah, job. I want to send them to Buccaneer.io because there may have been a merger. Some bots may have just joined the uh, Navy, <laughs> Ooh. actually. Oh, interesting. All right. Very good. Very good check out uh, me on the Twitter. I'm at Chris LAS. Follow the network at Jupiter Signal. Live times, jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. We'd love to have you there. Join the chat at discord.me slash jupitercolony and uh, go to the subreddit at coderadio.reddit.com and emails at jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. Okay, everybody, thanks for joining us in this week's episode of Coder Radio, and we'll see you right back here next week. Next week.